Hi everyone, I'm Professor Christina Chu and I will be teaching you in this online course of the Classics Department at Rutgers it's called Cities of the Classical World. And um, wow, let's take a look at our class. And I also wanted to say welcome back. I think that a couple of you have taken some classes with me before and I'm very glad to see, have you in class again. And this class is a little bit different in part because we are not using Sakai, we are using Canvas. Um, it's another learning management system, um, a little bit different, but I hope. Um, Canvas does have a mobile app, I should say, and I do recommend that you download that and put it on your phone or your iPad or whatever device you have. Uh, it can come in handy. And uh, it's actually one of the features of Canvas that makes it useful that's technology, we're talking about the ancient world. So this is a class um, that is about two of the major cities of the ancient world, Athens and Rome. We'll spend about half the semester on each city. Um, and while we will be looking a lot at archeological and architectural evidence um, about these two cities and what we can learn from those kinds of evidence. We will also be studying some ideas about cities in some key ancient texts, namely Plato's Republic and Aristotle's Politics, and also Virgil's Aeneid, and some selections to some other ancient authors. Um, I do recommend that if you haven't used Canvas before to look around the site a bit. Um, it's a lot simpler in its, uh, I think, uh, its setup than some of my Sakai classes have been. And um, the first thing to look at is this link called Course Essentials, which gives you very important information about me, namely my email address, which uh, I will say this a million times, you should not hesitate to contact me about questions large and small. On my faculty webpage, I teach in the Department of Classics at Rutgers. Um, also, these other uh, links are to an orientation about Canvas that takes you um, to another window. I think actually the best way to get to know a service is just to use it. Um, some links for things like the library, writing centers, etc. The library will come in handy because we do have a research essay for this class. And then um, finally, um, uh, some tools uh, for the course, just about for you to use Canvas and uh, file submitting assignments, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, you can always ask me too. Um, the other thing you'll need to and will really want to check on Canvas is, of course, you need to read the syllabus. Um, I do recommend that you do that sooner rather than later. Um, I have office hours via Skype or Google Hangouts. Um, it's my phone number. Um, and the text, well, first things first. Um, actually, all of the texts that have an asterisk next to them can be bought on Kindle, which I find quite useful. It means you can get them immediately. Uh, this text here about the archaeology of Athens, we have an assignment in it for next week, can actually be bought in a digital edition on Google Play, if anyone's interested in that. I actually bought it myself. Um, and I find it not um, unuseful. It's a page from the book here. Um, um, and what can I say? You absolutely must get the, this book called The Archaeology of Athens and the book called Rome and Oxford Archaeological Guide. You will not be able to do well in the class without them because these are books that, as you can see here, I'm looking at the camp book on uh, Google Play. They have all kinds of maps and pictures in them. and um, both of them are really more sort of archaeological guides um, than... So if you ever want to go to Athens or Rome, I think these books will actually come in rather handy. Um, and I, again, I do emphasize that you get these books. You will not be successful in the course without them. And um, I didn't give you an assignment in these books until the second week because I know you might want to try to order a used copy or some such. So. The other books, well, what can I say? All These are major works of Western uh, civilization, Aristotle's Politics, Plato's Republic, and Virgil's Aeneid. You can find all of them online and um, in uh, free translations. That's fine. To, it's fine to use those because I, you know, the main thing is I'd like you to read them. But I really encourage you to buy these uh, editions that I've noted here. 
especially because um, these editions always have really good notes and introductions and are often translated in a, in a style that I think is more readily understandable by English users, or contemporary users of English. Um, and they're not really that expensive on Kindle. They're often a little bit cheaper. So, uh, and um, some of these texts also, because two of them are philosophical uh, texts about political theory, be a little easier, I think, to have some good background information about the text that you're reading. This edition of Plato's Republic, um, I just as a side note, for those of you who took my Criminals and States class last semester, by the way, I love teaching that class. Thank you for all your great contributions. Um, this is a different edition of the Republic than I ordered for the Criminals and Saints class. I apologize to you if you bought that edition. I actually like this edition a lot. I think it's really a really good one. It especially has some really good things like an index and a wonderful introduction by a um, Greek uh, philosopher of ancient Greece, G.R.F. Ferrari, um, about uh, the historical period surrounding the Republic, which is certainly a seminal text in Western thought. So um, if you can, I do recommend that you buy these books. Um, and they're all available at the Rutgers Bookstore on Somerset Street, or you can get them online. Regarding the schedule for our class, uh, the main things you'll need to do is, you know, there's quite a bit of reading for this class. Um, not so much in the archaeological books as in the works by Plato, Aristotle, etc. Um, and there will be as weekly assignments in the class. But again, if you took a class from me before, I have uh, learned from reading your course evaluations that sometimes I've probably given you a little bit too much work. So hopefully this class will be a little tamer, right? Um, for weekly assignments, you'll either have to write a short essay, that means two pages, or take a quiz. In past classes, we've had to do both, one or the other. Uh, you'll have to participate every week in an online discussion forum. The purpose of that is so you can interact with other students in the class. There is a final research essay due uh, the last couple weeks of class and an in-person final exam. So the final exam you actually have to take in person on campus in New Brunswick. Uh, for better or for worse, that means you get to meet me, possibly, because I will proctor some of those exams. I love meeting everybody that I can. Um, since this is a fully online class. Um, so, um, the more detailed uh, descriptions about the assignments. Um, I just should probably note that academic honesty is an imperative in a course like this. Your work should represent your original work. And um, if you go to the end of this syllabus, you will see a detailed schedule of the many assignments that are due. I hope this doesn't freak you out. Um, because this is an online class, um, we do need to do some activities that would take the place of actually attending class. And that tends to either, again, be a quiz or an essay. Um, so, um, so you can look at this summary of the assignments here, which is helpful. And there's also a calendar, which will list all of the assignments and when they're due. Um, but you can also go and look at this section, which will really be the most important section to you, modules. And that's, of course, the grade section will be important for reasons that are obvious, people, to see who else is in the class. So uh, modules, this is a different feature about uh, Canvas than Sakai. You'll see there is a module for every week of the class. And I've set them up so uh, every week has a lecture um, by me. <laughs> Uh, and then also an assignment of readings. These say zero points, which does not mean they don't count. It just means that I just I, I didn't assign points to them. The, the good things that you get graded on are things like the essay. Uh, this week we have a discussion post. Um, and every week we'll have a discussion. Uh, you need to write one of your own posts in answer to the question. This week is just to do an introduction. It doesn't count for any points because I know everyone's just getting settled in the class. Um, also, this is, is a class about cities. I'd like you to say what city or town you're from or you live in today, just so you know. I mean, this is a class about ancient cities, but I hope it gets you to think about the place where you live or cities that you inhabit. I mean, New York City, um, really one of, if not the greatest cities in the world, in my humble opinion. And you should also respond to at least one other student's post. So um, this feature is really similar to the feature on Sakai, if you're familiar with Sakai. Um, and then, uh, but for most weeks, what you'll have to do is four things. Watch the lecture. Okay, the books. Um, and then um, every every other week, you'll have to write a short essay. And then every week, there'll be a discussion. And those are the points that will be due. And then uh, every other week, you'll have to do a quiz. 
Um, and I will provide you with information in advance about what will be on the quiz, the kinds of questions you'll get asked, the things you should know and study. Um, um, if you go and look at this whole schedule, you'll see that the essays are already noted along with the quizzes and basically what topics they'll be on. I don't actually have the assignments for essays posted yet, although I do actually have the assignment for the final essay, which is the research essay. Um, and um, so you can kind of get a sense of what you need to do. But as we move a little further into the semester, I will be posting the essay topics early. So that way, if you want to get ahead, you're encouraged to do that. Um, although um, most of the essays involve doing a certain amount of reading, so that might always not work out. And again, the last week we do the final exam. So please do take a look at the schedule and uh, let me know if you have any questions. And well, um, one of the things. Um, by going to, well, every week, um, in addition to making a lecture, I'm going to make you up a set of lecture notes, which will hopefully give you an idea of the um, assignments that you'll be doing and also um, of things that aren't mentioned in the text, things that you would have heard if you were going to a lecture in class. So this is Athens today. It's a picture taken from the Acropolis, the um, hill in the middle of Athens. This is Mount Lukavitos in the background. Um, um, Athens is actually located in kind of a plain surrounded by mountains. Um, the mountain over here is Mount Hymetos. And um, it's a very populated city, as you can see today. And it was quite populated also in ancient Greece, um, population about 200,000 at the time of classical Athens, much, much bigger now, of course. Um, but still, the topography is basically the same. And of course, there are many monuments in Athens that were there in the ancient world that are still there today. Um, so um, just once again, uh, so once again, just a description of what our class is about um, with a few more details, uh, namely uh, that we'll be reading again Plato's Republic, which is also the, actually the word politeia, and Aristotle's politica or politics. So these are all words that are related to the ancient Greek word for a city, which is a polis. And the Romans word for a city is an herbs. And um, we will be focusing on these ideas, origins of cities, how government systems and political culture come to be in cities, and also the role of cities in shaping human experience and creating the a citizen. You hear my spiel about buying the actual textbooks. Um, this is again just the grading scale, um, and again, uh, so note that most of you know 50% of your grade is based on the essays and quizzes, which are based on the readings and lectures. And generally, for the schedule, what you can expect is that um, on Fridays, you really only have one thing to do, which is the first discussion group post. And I've divided the discussion group posts one discussion group post is due on Friday, the other one is due on Sunday, and everything is always due at 11 59 p.m. or midnight at night. Um, uh, because um, there is a human tendency to do things at the last minute, which I understand, but uh, it does make life a little harder for your classmates if you post both of your discussion forum posts at 11.59 p.m. It means it's kind of hard for other people to respond to you. So if you could post your first post on Friday night or by Friday night, that would help everybody else out. Uh, we'll see how this goes. Uh, but uh, that's been something that people have brought up to me in previous classes, and I understand that um, human nature is what it is, but it would be great if you could post your first post a little earlier. And, you know, discussion posts will often be about the readings, but if there is also a question you have about the reading that you want to ask your classmates and, you know, that maybe would help you do your paper or quiz, you can ask that in a post. Um, um, and on Sunday night, uh, that will be when both the short essay or the quiz, whichever one we have due that week, and the second discussion group forum post are due. So um, this is a little bit in response to people telling me that last semester that they found some of the due dates a little hard to deal with. So hopefully this will make people happy. Sometimes no one is happy, but due on Sunday night will work out. You can always turn in things earlier too if you finish your essay on Friday night. I'd love to read it. Um, what about me? Well, uh, me. Uh, this is my email address. You should keep it handy. Write to me a lot. Um, I respond to questions large and small happily, and I respond within a couple hours. If you do not hear me respond, a response from me in 24 hours, something is wrong. That means no. Um, that's not that have that happen. 
But um, what it probably means is that maybe you were, you were emailing me at the wrong address, or maybe, oh no, your email went to spam, which is terrible, and it's not something I should know about immediately. Um, but just remember, um, you can't, don't hear from me within 24 hours. That's weird. So uh, really, I usually respond within a couple of hours. And um, another thing about me is that I, um, well, I teach at Rutgers. Um, I don't live in New Jersey. I live in California. Um, this is, uh, yeah, well, here you go. <laughs> here, New Jersey, California. I live in Berkeley, California. Um, and on the subject of cities, well, um, you know, if you click on this wonderful link, you'll just get to a Google page of images. Um, I was actually born in Oakland, California. Uh, so these are some wonderful images of, um, this is actually the Campanile, which is in the middle of the University of California Berkeley campus. This is the San Francisco Bay. This is Berkeley. Yeah, I live somewhere in there. And um, Oakland is, well, this is kind of an image of uh, Oakland is very hilly, so it's Berkeley. So this is looking out towards San Francisco. Oakland and uh, Berkeley are to the east of San Francisco, which, of course, is right on the, uh, right on the Pacific. And um, how does it come to be that I am sitting here in Berkeley, California, not far from where I was born? I was born in Oakland, California, um, what is used to be called Peel Hill because all these hospitals were located there. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so Oakland's a little bit south of Berkeley. And I'm showing you these maps because one thing that's going to happen a lot in this class is I'm going to show you a lot of maps, not of contemporary places, but of ancient Greece. So get ready for lots of maps. Um, anyways, um, I was born in Oakland. Um, I uh, lived here until I went to college back east in New Jersey, actually, not at Rutgers. Um, went to Princeton, and um, my husband went to both Rutgers. I went to Rutgers for both his undergrad and his graduate degrees. And um, here's my husband. He is James Fisher. He's a professor of uh, American religion, um, American studies, and history at Fordham University in New York City. This is our son, Charlie. He is 19 and a half. And um, he is severely autistic, uh, severe intellectual disability, severe autism. He was born that way, born in actually St. Louis, Missouri, where my husband was a professor at the time. And uh, so we've moved around, lived in lots of different cities. Um, but long story short, we came back to New Jersey in 201 because my husband is from New Jersey. And uh, his parents were getting older, wanted to be in her family. And um, Charlie, New Jersey has a lot of great autism schools. And Charlie did pretty well here. He's a big, big, you know, he's a big Jersey Shore guy. Loved to go to Long Beach Island, swim in the ocean, this boogie board. Also loves to ride bikes. He likes to be active. Um, Charlie doesn't abilities are such that he d isn't able to read or write and um, he doesn't talk really. He has talks in only one or two word sentences. And um, well, what can I say? Um, Charlie has a lot of struggles. So um, when Charlie in his, actually make, let me make sure that I'm sure I'll do the right thing. Okay. Um, and it just occurs to me now that you probably didn't see the pictures of Oakland that I put up, so I will. Um, software is always an adventure to use. And um, so when my son, though, my son is 19 and a half now, when he became an adolescent, life became pretty tough for him. He, um, for a lot of reasons, but he, my husband and I decided that we needed to be closer to my family out here in Oakland and she's in the South Bay. And uh, in San Jose, so we moved. I left my job. I taught for, I was the classes professor at St. Peter's University in Jersey City. And um, resigned from my job. I was an associate professor of classics. My husband took a leave. And we moved out here um, for Charlie. A rather a rocky start, because if you know anything about autism, um, autism involves um, a lot of, well, people who are autistic like Charlie like to have a lot of sameness in their life. And, you know, to go from New Jersey to living here, this is uh, Berkeley. I mentioned this earlier when I was trying to, I thought I was pointing to these pictures. I wasn't, I'm sorry. Um, well, this is Berkeley. This is called the Campanile. It's a tower in the middle of the U University of California at Berkeley campus. This is San Francisco over here. This is the Bay Bridge. Um, so this is West Berkeley and Oakland are east of San Francisco. Um, it's a beautiful area. Charlie uh, found it very different from New Jersey as it is, and um, it took him a little while to get used to it. And um, anyways, but once he did, which you know, 
gnashing of teeth and all that. Uh, he's actually done pretty well here, I would say. He has a lot more support services here. California um, is, I think, kind of a leader in providing services for developmental disabilities for adults. So uh, Charlie's out here now. And um, I was uh, I was very fortunate. I knew some of the faculty at uh, in the classes department at Rutgers, and they were kind enough actually to hire me to teach online classes two years ago. I started teaching uh, online classes for Rutgers in the spring of 2015, and um, well, here I am today. <laughs> so um, Rutgers actually hired me to do this full time because um, I, I do really enjoy teaching online classes and um, I enjoy teaching classics, that's for sure. So um, for all those reasons, that's why I'm here in California. I'm three hours behind you and uh, you are there in New Jersey, but I will be out to see you. Um, I will actually be coming out in February to hold some kind of office hours. Um, I do plan to, because my husband um, still teaches again at Fordham. He goes back and forth every two weeks. And um, I will, of course, uh, be up for some of these sessions of the midterm, the final exam, excuse me, in May. So meet you then. And well, wow, let's get started. So every week I'm going to give you um, a handout like this, um, a little bit detailed. And uh, my goal is not to talk so much with these lectures, but that doesn't seem to happen too much. So I apologize if um, I get kind of wordy. Um, and I will on this video because it's the first one. And I have just wanted to make sure you have all the information that you need. Um, but so you know, um, this first lecture is uh, going to point out to you, you must get the textbooks. Uh, the reading assignment is here about Aristotle's politics and um, just learn about quizzes and final exam. Those will include, quizzes and final exams will include um, identifications from the text that we read. And I always take the translations from the books that I assign. So if you use some other translation you find on the internet, that is okay, but it might make it harder to actually uh, do some of the quiz, the quizzes and the final exams. So I do encourage you to uh, get the text that I have um, noted. And I just note here too, the discussion forum post. Um, well, I know what everyone's background is in studying the ancient world, so I've included on this handout a timeline um, of Greece and Rome, and also just for the sake of comparison of the Near East. Um, Greek history, the archaeological record for Greek history, starts in what's called the Bronze Age, from about 3200 to 1100 BCE, with settlements in places like Crete, the island of Crete, and also in Greece. Um, this is the time when there are two major civilizations. One is called the Minoan civilization, which is centered on Crete. And also uh, late following it, a, um, a period called the Mycenaean Age, which is based on the Greek mainland. Um, but there's evidence that the Mycenaeans actually went to Crete, where the Minoans were living. You can see they overlap slightly. And it seems that the Mycenaeans might have had something to do with the decline of Minoan civilization. We don't know anything about this, though, because oh, we, for this is a period when most of our evidence comes from archaeological ruins. Um, and around this time, Athens, um, there are settlers, evidence of archaeological evidence of set settlements in Athens in, in, from the 11th to 7th century BCE, but nothing like written records. Where there are written records, along with archaeological evidence, is in the Near East, namely in uh, ancient Near Eastern civilizations like this, that of Sumer this, um, in the uh, southern Mesopotamian uh, region. Um, this is the era of Gilgamesh, if you've ever read that epic um, about, you know, the hero Gilgamesh and his friend um, Enkidu. It's actually, and Gilgamesh is associated actually with a great city called Uruk. Um, and um, also in the Near East, other great cities and uh, civilizations, which uh, includes the Assyrian Empire, uh, which really lasts a long time, really into the 7th century BCE. And BCE, by the way, stands for before B, the common C era, E. It is the same thing as saying B, C, before Christ. Uh, I prefer to use B, C, E in many classes this do because the cultures that we're talking here are the Near East, the Greeks, and the Romans are pre-Christian. And so uh, this seems to be um, a, um, an appropriate way to date things at that point. Um, in time, we use B, C, that is totally fine too. So um, it's my preference. Um, and then another ancient empire, the Akkadian Empire. So it's the era of Gilgamesh. 
And um, what I also put down for you here, as you can see, is again, some other events in the Near East, including some things referred to in the Hebrew Bible, like the Israelites, Age of the Judges, um, and the United Monarchy under Saul, David, and Solomon. We will not be covering this history. This is not something you need to know. It is here simply for your reference. You can ignore it if it confuses you. But this section about the Greeks, I think, should be helpful. Um, around 1150 is the traditional date of the Trojan War, which is the you know the great war talked about in Homer's Iliad um, and Odyssey. Uh, then from about 1100 to 800 is something called the Dark Ages or the Iron Age. It is so called because it is a time when the use of writing disappears from the Greek mainland. Um, and also when uh, the archaeological structures and the artifacts that are left are much less sophisticated. And um, it seems that there's a decline in the population. People are no longer making, you know, um, really elaborate weapons or vases or paintings, et cetera. Um, so that's why it has been called the Dark Ages. It's also called the Iron Age because it's the time when iron is discovered. So we start to see iron weapons for the first time. And the end of this era is when Homer's poetry is composed. Uh, the Greeks dis rediscover writing and adopt an alphabet from the Phoenicians who are a Near Eastern people. Um, from around, um, for instance, uh, Palestine and Lebanon. And then we enter really the age that we're really going to be focusing on called the Archaic Age from about 800 to 500 BCE, um, which is when the Greeks start to colonize or to create cities in other places. And also 776, an important date in Greek culture, when Olympic Games are held. These are important games because they bring together many people from many parts of Greece. And also for reference, 753, since we are going to talk about Greece and Rome in this class, is the founding of Rome in the Italian peninsula. So um, Rome is a much younger city than Athens, as you can see. Um, and also Roman culture develops a lot later um, than Athens, and of course the Romans supersede the Greeks, so to speak. Um, so as again, if you took the Chronos and Saints uh, class last semester, you're going to find some of the information at various parts of this class, quite familiar, discussion of tyrants. Um, that was a big subject in our Criminals and Saints class, which looked at, the Criminals and Saints class looked at Greek politics um, really in the archaic era, especially the rise of tyrants. Um, but I, I will be giving you these timelines really for reference. I think that they hopefully they will be of some help um, for you to um, get some context. And I also just gave you a big timeline here about the ancient Mediterranean. So you can kind of try to put everybody together, including the Egyptians, who are very ancient people, far more than others. And the Sumerians go back the same uh, time as them. Um, and then, as you see here, what we're really focusing on are, well, I mentioned the Minoans here, the Mycenaeans, the Greeks, uh, and then the Romans. So they, the Greeks and the Romans really, if you think about the history of well, Western civilization, are really occur sort of in the latter half of it of course, here in the 21st century. Well, Athens, the city that we are talking about for this class, and you know, just to give you an image again, so this again is the modern city of Athens, a beautiful place. Um, I've been to Athens three times, and if you don't have a chance to go, if you haven't had a chance to go, you must go someday. Um, Greece is a beautiful country and a um, wonderful place to look at. We saw the ancientness of the, the, of the culture all over the place, and um, it's really just a beautiful, fascinating place to go. Everybody should go. Um, Athens origins. Well, the origins of Athens are mythic, as you know. And you know, one thing you might want to do if you're thinking about where your own, you know, your own city. You know, what are the origins of your own city? Where did it? How did it come to be? Why is it called what it's called? You know, Oakland is called that because it has a lot of oak trees, actually. Um, and. Um, well, Athens is called Athens because uh, Athena is its patron goddess. She is the goddess of wisdom, um, a virgin goddess in Greek mythology. And um, she becomes the patron goddess of Athens after a contest with the sea god Poseidon in which she creates the olive tree. Poseidon creates the horse, but the olive tree is thought to be more useful because it produces both wood and the olives. It's also thought that Athena, um, the worship of her seems to have supplanted that of a fertility goddess around 1000 BCE. So back to that, you know, sort of uh, this age of the Mycenaeans is 1000 BCE. But some other myths of Athens origins, and we'll be mentioning some of these figures throughout the class, are Kekrops, or Kekrops, who's a mythical king associated with snakes. He's even depicted sometimes as part snake. He was thought to have organized Athens into 12 towns, including some towns that we're here about named Vraura and Eleusis. Another uh, mythical king of Athens is Erechtheus 
who was supposedly born of Gaia, the Earth, and Hephaestus, the forged god, grandfather of these great grandfather of well, Daedalus, who uh, is a great Greek craftsman in Greek mythology, who makes the labyrinth, um, and also of Theseus who is a, another uh, king of Athens. His father's name is Aegeus. He was also king of Athens. Um, this is associated with slaying the Minotaur on the island of Crete. And he's associated also sometimes with some uh, legends about Athenian government and politics. Namely, he is sometimes thought to have invented democracy. Um, Cronus and Saints, as you know, we read a couple of plays that refer to him. And uh, something called Sunoikismos, the unification of community. So in other words, these has something to do with bringing together all these different uh, 12 different towns into this with Athens as their capital. So these are the mythical figures of um, Athens. We know about them from later Greek literature. We don't have any, there's no, there's no specific document that tells us when Athens was founded or how it came to be exactly. We just know there's evidence of settlements there again from um, 11th and 7th century BCE. Well, Athens is what we call a polis. And uh, as you'll see um, in this definition of what a polis is, it basically means a city state. There's no real equivalent in English. I will frequently be referring to Greek terms in this class. And uh, I will give you the Greek letters. Um, if anyone wants to learn Greek, I highly encourage you to do that. It's a wonderful language. And, um, but I will transliterate the words. Um, of course, uh, the Greek word polis you'll hear a lot. It means a city, a city state, uh, the plural is polis. And the word polis occurs in a lot of other words you're going to hear, be hearing about this uh, semester, um, namely the word politeia, which means a constitution or organizational structure of the polis. It's used to translate the word, the, the word for republic, the, the original, the Greek word, Plato's Republic is called politeia in Greek. A uh, politikos which means a statement, who's someone who's concerned in the affairs of a polis. And uh, politika is actually the name, of the, the title of Aristotle's politics. I mean, his text is really about things that concern the polis. Um, and uh, the word polites means a citizen, so someone who inhabits a polis. So clearly this, the idea of a polis is, in some ways it's probably even more important, I think, than the idea of a city in our culture. Um, it's a fundamental idea of importance to studying ancient Greece. Well, here again we have Athens, a contemporary photo, um, next to a home, you know, Mr. Marios Katsaros. And many of these images are from the internet, um, but uh, this is the Acropolis in the center, and indeed, uh, and this is so, and this is um, the Athens, you know, right up to the edges of the ancient city. But one thing that's fascinating is this is literally when you go to Athens, there is literally a rocky hill right in the middle of it. You can see this is the Parthenon um, right in the center. It's very, very dramatic. It's beautiful. Um, so polis has a lot of definitions. One of them is that it means a defensible, fortified settlement on a height. And that's a term that gives us some indications about the origins of the polis in ancient Greece. Namely that uh, in the Mycenaean age, you know, polis was probably something like a, um, a, a, like a fort or a stronghold on top of a hill. Um, there's a Mycenaean word, poterijo, which looks like polis actually. Um, that suggests that this was um, a feature of Mycenaean life back in the, you know, the 1500s to about um, um, 1000 BCE. And these dates, by the way, for these ages are approximate. So sometimes I refer to a date that doesn't quite agree with something I've written down, but you just try to sort of hit the right millennia or century with these ancient dates. But um, Mycenaean strongholds are mentioned in Homer, and there's also lots of phys physical and archaeological evidence. So, um, for instance, um, there is, of course, the uh, the ancient, uh, it's a place you can go and visit, really, um, is Mycenae. So uh, Mycenae is, um, is why we call Mycenaean culture Mycenaean culture. But it's, uh, this is a city called Mykines, now on the Peloponnes, or the southern uh, peninsula of Greece. But if you go there, you can see the evidence of uh, this ancient stronghold and um, um, this is actually what the entrance to it looks like. So this sort of grand, massive architecture. These would have been lions. This is an example of a tomb from Mycenae. And um, this uh, picture gives no idea of how tall this is. I'm not good with numbers and heights, but um, it's a lot taller than your front door. Let me tell you, it's like probably about 
two, three stories high. Um, and these are evidence of the city walls that would have been part of the city stronghold in Mycenae. With the, and so in other words, the city up on a hill that the surrounding residents um, of uh, farmers, et cetera, who lived on the plains um, could have uh, taken refuge in um, in times of uh, you know attack or some such. And um, another meaning of a polis is indeed that it's an urban settlement. So it's a settle, it's something, to, it's a it's a settlement involving some kind of organized community city life. But in and so, but a one I meaning even if even if you think about this picture of the Acropolis in Athens, well, a polis isn't just this the the structure, you know, the fortification on top of um, the um, a, of this hill, it also involves the area all around it, the territory around it, sometimes called state territory. And that's certainly the case for Athens. So, you know, again, another map of Athens. So the Acropolis is roughly here, Abara, which is the uh, ancient marketplace city center, like a town square, center for commerce in ancient Athens. A um, major part of Athenian political life. The Acropolis actually function, comes to function in Athens as more sort of a religious shrine, a center of um, a center of uh, worship to Athena and other um, deities. Um, but these re the regions around Athens actually a part considered part of Athens, and um, there's, a, there's a political reason that's that's important because um, while since so much of the Athenian politician actually comes from the surrounding areas, especially from over here. Here, this is an area called Attica. There's a lot of smaller towns. Um, that gives uh, Athena, Athens an incredible amount of manpower, literally, uh, to fight its wars in the fifth century BCE against uh, the Persians and the Spartans. But um, again, so this is, um, you'll, we're gonna go over so many of these plans of the city of Athens. You're hopefully gonna get tired of them because that means you'll know them well. But um, Athens was actually at some point surrounded by city walls. Um, um, as you can kind of see from this picture, Athens and Greece in general is very rocky. And so there are actually a number of other smaller hills uh, surrounding the Acropolis. It's clearly the tallest though. And uh, there are also a couple of rivers that run through uh, Athens, namely the Eridanos and the Elysus, um, which uh, we mentioned, um, or actually mentioned definitely in our book. Um, and well, a polis could contain 700 to 2,000 individuals. Athens at its peak in the classical era probably had about 200,000. So that's actually roughly about the size of the city of Berkeley out here, um, where I live. Um, and um, the polis, one thing we noticed was that it was dependent on some kind of continual subsistence. Um, namely, uh, whereas the political stronghold or the military stronghold in the center um, that was uh, part of the, um, where the ruler would have um, presided, um, farmers and communities um, from the territory around the polis would have brought in goods, so grain, cattle, et cetera, in, in exchange for protection from um, the king or the warlord or whatever he was called. Um, and with the idea that also that in times of attack, uh, residents from the surrounding areas could come up into the city proper and actually seek refuge behind the city stronghold. Um, in the archaic period, so the late 8th century, um, the Athenian um, Greeks actually also, they don't, um, they create poles, they'll get in the plural, in other parts of the Mediterranean world, including in Sicily. So if you go to a place like Syracuse today, that actually um, is an ancient Greek colony. And um, there were probably all told, if you're looking at all the ancient world, about 1,500 polis type settlements. So not only in the Greek mainland, but also um, other places where the Greeks traveled to. So in Sicily, on the coast, the western coast of Turkey, in the Black Sea, and then later on in what we call the Hellenistic kingdoms of Egypt, Near East, and Macedonia in Northern Greece. And um, if you took the Cleopatra class, um, spring of 2016, you should know a little, you should hopefully remember a little bit about the Hellenistic um, empire that followed Alexander the Great's conquest. So um, many of the cities like Alexandria that we studied are indeed polis. Um, yet another map of Athens, yes. So this is the, so this circular part is the part here. And over here is actually the port of Athens uh, protected by these are called the long walls. So these are walls that the Athenians actually built 
um, to protect Athens and its grain supply from the Spartans during the Peloponnesian War in the 5th century BCE. Um, but also just to give you an idea again of how the polis in the terms of Athens really doesn't just mean the city proper, it really does include um, the other, you know, these other areas that extend outward and are also claimed by Athens. Here again you see the river, the Ulysses, uh, the Eridanus is over here, and this is another major river called the Kephissus. You can think of that really, I think, in terms of New York City. You know, I mean, if Manhattan is, okay, the heart of, maybe, some consider it the heart of New York, well, the boroughs are equally important and are all really part of New York City, Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, um, and the Bronx. So sort of a similar idea. I mean, if Manhattan, if New York was only Manhattan, it certainly would not be, it would be a much smaller city, that's for sure. So, you know, these first definitions about a polis have to do with its topographical uh, features, but others, uh, but in a lot of ways, a polis is really about the people in it. And so uh, the term polis refers to, it's a community of politai, which is the plural of politeis, more Greek, I know, um, and, uh, you know, with public spaces like the agora. And uh, polis, police could interact with each other or they could be isolated and uh, choose not to, and they could be, police could be dominated by others. That happens during the Peloponnesian War when Athens becomes a very, it was always a very powerful, is a very powerful polis that dominates the smaller, smaller neighbors. Um, and then, of course, the word polis is very much a political concept um, referring to a very, a part of, a way of life and a way of government um, and a way of politics that's very characteristic of ancient Greece. It has a lot to do with these public spaces such as the Agora. Um, okay. Uh, and then here is indeed a map of the Agora um, in Athens, uh, which we will be studying um, extensively. And I should say that the author of the book called The Archaeology of Athens is actually was at one point the head of excavating the Agora in Athens. So I think he definitely knows what he's talking about um, in the book. So um, that's one reason that I chose the book. Um, I mean, the Agora was really a collection of all kinds of, of really government and political buildings, as you can see here, including all these stoa are these long buildings, which are they're sort of they have long colonnades. Um, the Stoa Poikile was actually where the philosopher Zeno, who's the famous founder of the Stoic school of philosophy, uh, did his teaching. Stoa could also contain shops. Um, the uh, Medean was actually a theater where musical uh, competitions were held. Uh, there are temples here, altars to gods, and also um, important uh, civic features like law courts, uh, the Tholos, an administrative building, the Metron is actually another temple to a kind of mother goddess, etc. So really the Agora, the center of Athenian life, politically, um, but also in terms of culture and attainment. Um, from the archaic period on, polis again refers to a kind of political organization. Um, referring in to some very particular Greek characteristics um, that which I think the study of ancient Greek political systems, philosophy, and more, tragedy even, um, especially political self-determination and self-government, and especially a concept autonomia, which literally means to have one's own laws. So in other words, the pursuit of independence, both internal and external. External meaning that a polis is not ruled, by another polis, it's ruled by the people who live in it. It's particularly by those adult males who uh, have the, as we shall say, have, have, are, have citizenship. Um, and citizenship tends to be through birth, but sometimes it's through property qualifications. That's the case with the Spartans. Polis is a very distinct system, and um, polis had not only their own buildings, but also their own calendars kinds of currency, their own economic system, their own feast days, their own sanctuaries, um, and their own armies, in some cases their own fleet. What they don't tend to have is their own separate languages. Um, also brings the polis together is that Greek, at least for a Greek polis, because the word polis can be used to apply to non-Greek communities like Rome is a polis, Carthage is a pol pol uh, polis, Carthage is in northern Greece. It's in um, northern Africa. Excuse me. Sorry. Carthage is in northern Africa, um, where uh, it's where modern day Tunisia is. A polis um, 
in the Greeks, many Greek poets often all spoke Greek, and Greek would have probably been even a language that would have been spoken certainly at these places too. So Greek is kind of a lingua franca in the ancient world. Um, a polis territory can also spread out over a larger geographical area, so it doesn't again just have to include that kind of city core. And uh, in particular, smaller units of a polis can occasionally have some administrative and political autonomy. That's the case of what's called the deans of Athens. Um, so some of them are noted here. So these are sort of smaller outlying communities that people belong to, that they had political identity with, but they were still considered part of Athens. And so we'll be studying more about them too. Um, overall, Polish regarded itself as a body of citizens, or the word koinonia, ton politon, um, instead of a unit of territory. So generally, a polis is not seen so much as a place, a specific, you know, boundaries, territory, geographically, but in terms of the citizens who make it up. And we see that in ancient Greek because it's more likely for a polis, a state, to refer to itself by its citizens as the Athenaioi or the Lacedaemoniai. Athenaia literally means Athenians, but it can refer to Athens. And Lacodaemonia refers to the Lacodaemonians, who are the Spartans, so that refers to Sparta, um, instead of using a word that refers to its territory. Um, and generally, yes, a polis was a place where people tended to know each other um, and be able to meet an assembly. And larger polis, which would include Athens and Sparta, um, were actually kind of rare. And even though the population of a polis might be something like 200,000, like a big polis, um, Athens or Sparta, really only about 30 to 50,000 of the citizens would be politically enfranchised. In other words, only you can only vote and participate in political life in a polis, a Greek polis, if you are male and a citizen and above a certain age. You cannot if you're a child, a woman, a slave, or a foreign resident. And the polis is very tied up in political life, and in particular of a growth of politically active strata of the population. In other words, not being uh, part of being a polites is participating in the life of the polis, the political life, instead of being ruled, for instance, by a king. Um, this is attributed in part to a major change in military engagement or fighting style that occurs around the 8th century BCE. This is a picture of a Greek hoplite who is a heavily armed foot soldier with his shield, his greaves, etc., his helmet. Um, he had to provide his own armor. Um, who, and the hoplites fought in a phalanx or in a line of. Um, uh, you've seen this probably if you watch, you know, Alexander the Great, Alexander, sorry, the movie by Oliver Stone about Alexander the Great, or to some extent, the 300 movies shows the phalanx, but we won't talk about 300 right now. Um, and um, whereas in Homer's epics, uh, fighting tends to happen between, sort of one on one combat between aristocrats. But the polis also sees the growth of laws, so also individual polis would have their own sets of laws. And um, there would also be an institutionalization of certain political forms, and in particular um, of advisory councils. So Athens has this bully, uh, or, or, uh, or Sparta has this gerousia. The Areopagus is a court in Athens, a high court um, that comes to only uh, be uh, given the task of uh, judging uh, capital cases, capital punishment, and also uh, various kinds of officials arise in a polis, particular magistrates who only can rule for fixed periods of time. And it's also important to know that the polis, even after the decline or the transformation, excuse me, of uh, the Greek world uh, um, in the third century, late fourth century, early uh, the early third century BCE, when Philip of Macedon, Macedon's in the northern part of Greece, Athens is in the southern part of Greece, and the Macedonians are ruled not by democracies um, in polis as the Athenians are, but um, under a monarchy, a hereditary monarchy. So that's the case. Philip II of Macedon was king, passed his uh, rule on to his son Alexander, who was Alexander the Great, and their successors. So Alexander and his successors actually created many different polis around the Mediterranean. One of them is Alexandria, for instance, or Byzantium. Um, well, Byzantium wasn't a polis that Alexander founded, but it was a city that he, um, he had to rule. Um, but um, these became, uh, still became police. Um, 
that were under Alexander or his successor's control, but to some extent still um, had the political institutions characteristic of a polis, especially their autonomy or freedom. And uh, it really was only until I would say the Principate, or Principate, which is another way to refer to the Roman Empire, uh, that the polis as a kind of individual, independent political unit thrives. Um, it's only under the Roman Empire, you know, and when the Emperor Augustus rises to power in 33 BCE after the Battle of Actium, um, that this limited freedom of the polis really disappears. And uh, you suddenly see polis, all of um, their government um, officials, et cetera, are um, uh, in Rome uh, under the emperor, with the Romans sending out officials to rule uh, Greece for each of the province and other polis. Um, that said, uh, many of these ancient Greek cities still were centers of finance or administration or communication. And it is the case that it is in these old urban centers, Alexandria, uh, Salonika, the Saliniki, uh, that Christianity first took hold. So very interesting sort of phenomenon. And this is a watercolor of Athens in its classical age, just to give you an idea again of the Acropolis. And um, you know, some idea that ancient Athens was a large, bustling, very uh, well populated and very culturally exciting uh, metropolis in the ancient world. Well, our class is really looking both at the archaeological aspects of cities, again, and so yeah, all the maps I'm going to keep throwing at you, um, but also we are also going to be looking at ideas about cities. So, um, and I'll try to balance this out during lecture and to some extent during quizzes. So our, uh, well, generally our writing assignments will be about the text that we read. Um, the quizzes will be a combination they will ask you to know some of the knowledge um, from the lectures and the lecture notes um, about the archaeological monuments, et cetera, that we study, um, whereas the essays will tend to ask you sort of interpretive questions about the readings. So the first thing we're reading is Aristotle's Politics, which is a little bit out of order because, yes, Plato lived before Aristotle. Um, Aristotle was one of his uh, students. Academy. But, um, the politics, I think, makes a little bit more sense to start with because of what Aristotle talks about. I mean, Aristotle is much more direct in talking about the origins of a polis. So um, this is actually a map. Yes, this is the Acropolis. So, you know, and this is the Agora. Uh, and so this is a map that actually shows the different philosophical schools in Athens. So one thing to know about Athens is that it was certainly a center of higher learning, as we would say today. Um, this is, uh, so Plato's Academy was actually quite a bit outside of the city and out of the way of the, um, the, um, of the Agora. The Stoa Porcule, where again, uh, the Stoic philosopher Zeno practice was here. The Lyceum is the philosophical school founded by Aristotle, actually, over here. And this is the Epicurean Garden here. The School of Epicurus, the Idas of the Epicureans, um, who flourished really during the Hellenistic era. So Athens, again, is a center of learning, which it still was considered certainly in the time of the Romans, like Romans like Cicero. Aristotle himself was not from Athens. He came there to, to found a school and to teach. Um, he was actually from Stagira, which is in Macedonia. And um, his father, Nicomachus, was a physician. Plato, Plato was sitting with Socrates. And uh, it's said that Aristotle tutored Alexander the Great um, in Macedonia after Plato's death and uh, returned to Athens to found his own school, the Lyceum in Athens died in 322 BCE. Um, Aristotle has a number of surviving texts that are about um, philosophical topics, but also ethical topics like the Nicomachean Ethics. There are astronom astron astronomical topics, um, medical topics, biological topics. So, um, but none of these were actually meant for publication. So that's really important to keep in mind when you're reading Aristotle. He's not like Plato's dialogues were what he wanted you to read. Aristotle's texts are all lecture notes. They weren't necessarily written down by him. They may have been taken by his students. Sketches, you could say. Um, of uh, things that he wrote. Um, I guess I should also say political. If you took criminals and saints, you may remember we read the Constitution of Athens, attributed to Aristotle. Um, and Aristotle's philosophy is characterized, you could say, by um, he always starts with what he calls phenomena, which, a Greek, which is from a Greek word, literally means things that appear. And um, with 
And Aristotle starts with what he sees with experience, you know, as it were, the data of experience from our senses. And um, that's very different from Plato, as we'll talk about when we read more of the Republic. So when Aristotle starts talking about a city, he really uh, starts by looking at the cities that he sees that we live in. And, um, you know, the polis would certainly have been a familiar idea to any ancient Greek at the time of Aristotle's life. Um, Aristotle, uh, for instance, the politics, Aristotle has this very famous statement that humans are a political animal, a political zoon, an animal, a living being, a zoon, a creature who has something to do with the affairs of the city. Aristotle says that humans live together by nature, that it's something intrinsic in being human that causes us to live in a community, a polis. So the polis, he says, is natural. Um, human beings naturally, as Aristotle says, points form families. And out of uh, the association that humans have in families, these turn into villages, and that uh, pol polis arise uh, as a um, as a result of the natural outgrowths of a village. According to Aristotle, the goal of a household or an archaea, so a household which can, would consist of males and females and children, um, it's a basic unit of society. The goal of a household is to meet reproduction and daily needs, like a family does. Then when you have many archaea together, this could become a village. But the village, according to Aristotle, and he says all this in the first part of the politics, so I'm just kind of summarizing some things for you when you start to read it. He calls the village an oversized family, which has a head man instead of a father, and it can start to plan for its needs in the longer term. And then, uh, you know, at the next stage after the village, planning even more long term is the polis. And according to Aristotle, and this has to do with Aristotle's sort of wider philosophical views, the goal of a polis is the complete human good. So something, according to Aristotle, the purpose of a city is to help human beings achieve what human beings can achieve, the complete human good. A polis, he says, is fully self-sufficient and is also natural. So in other words, Aristotle links uh, the creation of cities, the origins of cities, with something about being intrinsically human, um, and especially about humans achieving their full potential by living in a city. So this is rather, I think, a grand idea to think about, you know, that's, that's something that we're social creatures, human beings, so you need to live in a community. And that, you know, the idea is that the institutions that arise in a city um, also arise naturally, you know, that humans therefore have this ability to form government systems to help, you know, govern their lives and those, they, those whom they live with. So these are ideas you see in the first book of the politics. Now, the first book of the politics also contains some very problematic statements, um, which I think is the best to, to address very upfront here. Namely, the first book of the politics also discusses Aristotle's views on natural slavery, and there's no way around it. These are not ideas that um, anyone today, I think, would feel comfortable with. I would make that a blanket statement. Um, but 1.5. Aristotle attempts to justify what he calls natural slavery. In other words, those who, by their nature, um, those human beings who are suited for being a slave. Um, when Aristotle talks about slave, he's referring to what is called chattel slavery. Um, and that is actually uh, the system of slavery that existed in the American South until the 19th century, um, before the 20th century, I would say. Um, and um, it was also the case in ancient Greece. And uh, it's an, it is an understatement to say that Greek society depended very much on slavery. It did. One way to think about slaves in the ancient world and how intrinsic there were to, fun to the functioning of society was that, um, and I've probably mentioned this to you before if you've been in one of my previous classes, is that well, being a, whenever you do something mechanical, washing your clothes, Turning on the computer, turning on a light, keeping your food cold so, you know, you can have, you know, ice cream at, you know, midnight or whatever you want it. Well, um, in the ancient world, anything that involved sort of a mechanical process would have actually involved a slave. Um, so slaves were to have been responsible for heating up water. Slaves would have been responsible for making food, for spinning cloth, for the clothes that you wear, for taking care of your animals. Um, everybody had slaves. 
And um, that would include a very poor farmer to a very, very rich businessman who would have a household full of slaves. So, um, and the, the life that slaves lived varied. Slaves in some cases, if they worked in mines, for instance, um, you know, mining coal or, you know, gold would have been terrible. There's no question about it. There's no way we can, you know, sugarcoat any of this. Um, slaves who were prostitutes, um, probably that unsaid. Um, slaves who lived in a household near their master who maybe were their personal servant or who were a tutor for a, uh, an owner's children, they might have lived actually very comfortable lives and been treated as one of the family. Um, that having been said, um, slaves, the way to think about the relationship of a slave is that in the system of chattel slavery, a slave is associated with someone who's the property of another human being. Um, it's very analogous, if you will, to, you know, well, many of you may have, you know, uh, a living creature who lives in your house, who is completely dependent on you for their food, uh, for their shelter, for their activities. You know, when you, when, when you want them to go outside, they go outside. When you want them to come inside, they go inside. I'm referring to pets, dogs, cats, even. Um, and um, slaves, in a lot of ways, were in a very similar position in the ancient world. Slavery in the ancient Greece and Rome, keep in mind, was not based on race, which, of course, in the US, is, we can't think about slavery except through race. Um, slaves, indeed, though, in the ancient world were people you had conquered. <laughs> And so uh, they were often, uh, but not only what were called barbarians, which is a term that always needs a little bit of qualification. So the ancient Greeks did see themselves as sharing some kind of common ancestry. And the polos, I think, is part of that common ancestry they saw that they shared. Um, ancient Greeks, you know, they had loosely organized religious beliefs that they shared, for instance, all believing in the Olympian gods, Zeus, Hera, Athena, etc. And also, uh, they spoke the same language, basically Greek. Um, there are different dialects of Greek, but basically the same language. So that was something that distinguished Greeks from others. In fact, the definition of a barbarian in ancient Greece is somebody who does not speak Greek. Um, and the Greeks would have considered even those like the Egyptians, whose civilization was much older than the Greeks, the Greeks knew that, and which the Greeks respected very much as a barbarian, something by not having, um, speaking Greek. So the word barbarian, doesn't all it doesn't exactly have the pejorative meanings, the negative meanings it does today um, among the ancient Greeks, but that which is not to say that it is a positive word. It means basically being a non-Greek and depending, I think, on your cultural economic status, it's gonna have different shades of meaning. Not all Greeks, I would say, or those who lived in Greek cultures, um, believed to have the same views about slavery as Aristotle. So that's something else to keep in mind. For instance, Herodotus, who's a historian actually from the western coast of Turkey, um, Halicarnassus, um, notes in his histories, so we're going to read a little around this um, in a couple weeks, um, that custom is king. People in different places have different beliefs, myths, and cultural practices, and these are something to be noted and uh, to be remarked upon. And they do affect people, he says, but um, that doesn't, you know, Herodotus doesn't, doesn't, how should we say, he's acknowledges that different people have different customs, which seems kind of obvious to us today. Um, but, you know, if you think that the average ancient person didn't travel at all far from where they lived, never saw anybody who wasn't from um, where uh, nearby um, where they had grown up, um, you know, that's kind of actually a bigger revolutionary statement than we might think it is today. Um, Aristotle does not seem to recognize the arbitrariness of the distinction between Greeks and barbarians as Herodotus does. You know, so, you know, Herodotus has more of a sense that, you know, the reason that someone has come from a different culture um, is, um, you know, kind of depends on who's looking at it. You know, um, if you're, uh, you know, a Lydian, you might think that the Persians or the Greeks just do things in a really strange way. So, Herodotus believes that while Greeks can rule and be ruled, which means they're suitable to be rulers, barbarians lack this ruling element in their souls. And so that's why they can be ruled in the manner of slaves. So according to Aristotle, barbarians lack the sort of, it, 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 the ruling element is related to reason, especially. It is that. Um, looking at another part of the politics that um, slavery is an essential institution. A slave is a living tool or an instrument which rocks there would be no leisure for the activities which really make life worthwhile. Aristotle said, 
Aristotle justice this argument again with this idea that slaves uh, are naturally lacking in this ruling element because why? Because some human beings, says Aristotle, lack the sort of rational power necessary for ruling or giving directions. That makes them suited to be slaves. Though he does admit that there are some who are enslaved who uh, were not intended by nature to be a slave. So in other words, Aristotle sees that some people should be slaves because they lack this rational ruling ability. Um, and uh, because Aristotle thought that trade and manual labor was unfit for a free man, a free man who could reason, um, these kinds of activities, uh, working in fields, mining for precious metals, should be left to slaves or non-citizen foreigners. Um, and um, yes, Aristotle's views of slavery are so connected to his political, to his overall sort of belief system that, you know, in order to have the good life, remember he says the good life is part of the goal of the city, and having the good life means that you need to have leisure from manual labor. Manual labor should be left to those who lack the ruling power, the ruling element, that kind of reason. And Aristotle also definitely has a belief in nature as hierarchically organized with lower elements existing for the sake of the higher. So the idea that slaves exist um, with their lower reasoning abilities for the sake of those with higher reasoning abilities. Um, so this is a feature of the politics that cannot be escaped. And it was certainly used as an argument to justify slavery in our own country. Um, and um, Aristotle also has some views about women and gender in general that um, I think are not be, will not be popular today. Um, and um, they should be read. Um, they were not universally held by all Greeks and ancient peoples, and as we'll see in the Republic, Plato actually says that his ideal city should be ruled by philosopher rulers who can be women as well as men. So, ancient literature can surprise you. Uh, but those are some of the things that Aristotle says um, in his ideas about uh, how cities come together. And um, it has to do, you know, a way to put slaves into uh, his hierarchical understanding. Um, but please do um, look over those arguments. And um, why also bring up slaves? Well, I think in a class about ancient cities, that it's also just important to acknowledge the reality of slavery because, let's face it, Athenian citizens or citizens of the ancient world, they didn't build all these wonderful monuments. Some of the the labor that must have been involved was by citizens, but some must also surely have been done by slaves. And so I think that in order to make our understanding of the cities of the ancient world complete, we do need to think about all the inhabitants of them. Um, you know, as I said, only about 30 to 50,000 um, of the inhabitants of a 200,000 of the city of Athens, which would have had perhaps 200,000 um, individuals in it. Um, during uh, the age of classical Athens where only, you know, really about a quarter of the people could vote. Um, and and uh, that means women could not again and slaves could not. And so, you know, we don't know how many slaves there were in ancient Athens or ancient Rome. Some people suspect they might have been as much of a third of the population. So um, in any study of the ancient world, I do think that is necessary to think about those whose voices have not been preserved. And that also includes women which is another reason why um, in our class we will, you know, well, we'll certainly be looking at a lot of the major monuments that have been left to us, so political and um, religious uh, shrines and um, buildings. We'll also try to really look at domestic space and see, you know, cities are certainly not only are made for all kinds of people. And one thing we'll hope to do in this class is to think about who are all those kinds of people? What do we know about them? What can we find about them by studying archeological remains? and texts by Greeks and Romans. So um, it's great to get to meet you. And um, please you know, send me an email with any questions. Um, and um, I hope we have a great semester together. And I look forward to reading about what city you are from. I'll try to tell you a little about the ones that I live in myself.